I grew up uh, in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in uh, Earliesville, Virginia, right outside of Charlottesville. Grew up dirt poor, wrong side of the wrong side of the tracks. Um, you know, uh, dad was an alcoholic and a drug user. Uh, for the most part, he was absent. Uh, I was the middle son, so no matter what happened, I always got beat for it. You know, being a middle child, so on and so forth, whether I had anything to do with it or not. Um, and going to school, you know, we went to a pretty nice school, actually. And we were, I mean, by far the poorest there, you know. So we got picked on, made fun of and stuff like that, and just started fighting, you know. I never bullied anybody, but I would always pick fights with the bullies because I hated it. I, you know, I know what it feel like to be put down and made fun of. So I would take the bullies, I'd stuff their heads in the toilets, you know. That's just all I've ever known was how to fight. My dad made me fight, you know, we sawed off two by fours just to toughen us up and make us hard. He said, if you get into a fight, you damn sure better finish it. And if you lose, I'm gonna beat your ass for it. That's pretty much, I mean, unfortunately, that's pretty much my childhood. You know, all I've ever known was violence. You know, it, it wasn't the solution to the problem. It was just life. Now I'm doing 1,214 years in the state of Virginia without parole. Um, that's pretty much it. Patrick, can you take a call? I'm gonna take your handcuffs off. Let us control your hands. thing that segregation means to me is extreme loneliness and boredom. That's the main thing, loneliness. You know, don't care how tough you are, I don't care how badass you are, you can Bruce Lee it up all day long. It gets to you and it hurts like hell. Everybody's just 
basically walking over top of you. You can hear them, but they can't hear you. That's the way I feel, forgotten. You know? And that is not a comfortable feeling at all. When you're alone, you tend to reflect on your thoughts a lot. You tend to maybe regress into yourself a lot. You just have nobody. You truly are alone. And anyone who says, you know, I would love to be alone, I don't think they've been alone. So. Because when they do, they'll experience it and they'll, they'll hate it. I've been in set going on eight years. And when you're in here, you don't have the contact that you want. Every time you leave the cell, you got to strip. Correll, squat golf. Notice to the bottoms of your feet. Other one. And then you're in handcuffs. You're in shackles. And you know you got a gun up there in the booth. While it's not necessarily pointed at you, it only takes a couple seconds. You get to go to the shower, you know, talk through the doors a little bit. You get to go outside on the wreck cages, you know, for an hour, a few days a week. So when you're in here, you're around hundreds of other guys. Inmates and the COs. But you walk alone. Red Onion was opened in August of 1998. Uh, it was opened to be a security level six segregation facility, Supermax, basically a totally lockdown facility where most offenders remain in the cell 23 hours a day, seven days a week. I came here as assistant warden at the time. We opened the facility, we brought offenders in that had negative behavior. 
the worst behaving offenders in the state. And we brought them from other facilities to Red Onion to be able to house them in a more secure environment than the lower level facilities. My name is Michael Kelly. I'm originally from South Central Los Angeles. I don't know nobody out here. I don't have no family, no friends out here. I don't know a soul in Virginia. I came out here to Virginia to drop somebody off and I committed a couple robberies. And the courts in Virginia gave me 38 years for two armed robberies. If I would have known that I would have got 38 years for two armed robberies, like, I would have never done it. You know what I mean? Because I would have been like, holy shit, I'm not finna throw my life away for 38 years for two armed robberies. That's crazy. That sounds nuts. But I didn't know how serious it was out here in Virginia. In California, I would have got like eight years and I would have been that, you know? But <laughs> I didn't know how serious it was. And I didn't know how serious um, society took that. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a gangster. I wanted to be like my father. You know, in California, where I came from, we don't really look at gang banging as, as, as being crazy. It's just kind of our culture. It's a neighborhood thing. Like, if you're from the neighborhood, that's your family. You know, that's, 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 your, that's everything to you. You know, when we're young, you got people that you look up to and say, we want to be like them. You know, I want to be like him. Like, look at his car, you know. Look at the girls that like him. Like, I want to be like him. I want to look like him when I get older. That's my America. And I'm in prison now. And they put me in segregation for fighting. And being in that cell 23 hours a day, it's a mental challenge in itself. Just being in that cell for so long, it, 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 it's a psychological thing, you know? Any and everything that we go through is just in that little box, in that little cell trying to like create things to do. Trying to keep from going crazy, like every day, all day. Like for me, my therapeutic time is cleaning up every day. When I get up in the morning, I clean up. When I go to bed at night, I clean up. You know, hit the floor, the wall, the sink, just clean everything, get it all straight, spick and span, right? But I don't know, I think that's just maybe OCD or something, I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy a little bit. The COs can't really understand, you know what I mean? They're here half the time we're here, you know what I mean? But at the same time, they leave, you know, and they go back into the real world and they come back. This is our world. Tracking the development of a winter storm here along the east coast and just starting to see some snow in the north and south Dakotas, a bitter cold arctic air from the south. That ends the warmer air to the southeast and then we get that storm developing so it's just initially starting to develop now. Temperatures are dropping.
close. Some days it can be easy going, and then some days your stress level can be out the roof. And it feels like you're doing time, because you have to come right back and do it the next morning. But you make what? You make the best of it. And in order to maintain control, you have to be firm. Face the back wall, spread your butt cheeks, squat and cough. Working in the Supermax prison, it'll definitely make you tougher. 28! Maintaining, you know, your, your calm is, is quite an achievement when dealing with some of these guys. And some days it feels like the day's just not going to end. You know, it's one thing right after another. I'm a unit manager of D building. I've been with the Department of Corrections now for 16 years. I started as an officer, and I was promoted to sergeant, then to lieutenant, then unit manager. Open up the hard part for some staff is because they're on such great alert 12 hours a day, and there's the potential for violence. When you go home and it's time to relax, sometimes it's hard to let your mind yeah. relax because you're still definitely on yeah. guard. So I think that adds to the stress of this profession. You look at things different. Uh, when I'm out on vacation or out in big crowds with my family, you know, I'm always looking around. Yeah. I think that's to do with this job. You have to just let red onion be red onion, you know? And it takes, a, a, it takes experience to really settle in to the point that you realize this is just a job. You know, we don't have to live here. My name is Lars Hansen. Um, I'm a lifer. I have a life sentence. And life in Virginia means uh, life without parole. You're, you're in. And uh, uh, people who have a release date, uh, their mentality is different than an individual like myself who, where we have life. It's, it's life. And it's, it's, it's very impact. It's, it's uh, <laughs> it's depressing, it's sad, it's, uh, uh, it can really overwhelm you. So when you have to live with that year on end, year on end, um, you know, it, it can take a toll on you. I'm 41 years old. Uh, I've been incarcerated here in Virginia for almost 20 years now. I started getting in trouble, you know, nothing major. I, was, I guess uh, probably 13 years old. But I come from good parents. You know, they loved me. Uh, you know, they didn't beat me. They, uh, they taught me to respect people. And uh, I have a brother who lives in Texas. And we're just alike. It's just that I, I made the bad choices, and he didn't, and, you know, he's doing really well. When I was 17, uh, I shot a guy, and I did five and a half years in prison in Hagerstown. And I think that kind of messed me up a little bit, because it's very violent out there. I told the parole board this, they paroled me. And so I went home, age 22, and I was home for six months, but I still had the mind frame of an inmate. Uh, mentality when you're incarcerated is you don't want anybody to really disrespect you or take advantage of you or, uh, you, know, you know, stuff like that. And um, so um, 
I was at a gas station with my girlfriend, and there's uh, two guys that just kept harassing my girlfriend and I, and uh, they just kept on, kept on, and kept on, and kept on, and I snapped, and uh, I stabbed them, and I killed them, and they gave me a life sentence. I mean, I'm up here for attempted escape. All right, I actually scaled the fence and I could cut up real bad. Uh, I got myself stuck in the fence. Uh, I bled out. I woke up on the chopper, uh, and then they medevac me, saved my life, brought me to Red Onion. And I've been here in the segregation ever since then. Segregation is tricky on the inmate because if the inmate is not careful. They adapt to it. And they start becoming antisocial and become crazy. They can lose their mind. Ask yourself, can you live in a bathroom for 10 years? It's bad to lock a, an individual up and just put them in a in a room or a closed, you know, nothing to do. It's it's, it's I guess you could say inhumane. And I know that we're inmates and all, all you're inmates, but it, it, excuse my language, it fucks me up. And I've been in segregation going on 17 years. But I've been locked up for 27 years. And do you mind telling me about the original charge you caught? Armed robberies. And I, I shot one person in the arm robbery with malicious wounding. Well, I didn't shoot him. It was uh, I shot up in the air, told him to get on the ground, and the bullet ricocheted off the steel eye beam in the ceiling, ricocheted off the brick wall, and hit the cashier in the foot. And they gave me 30 years for that. <laughs> A ricochet bullet that didn't have no intent to hurt nobody. I shot up in the air. They, they even testified I shot up in the air. But the judge didn't see it that way. He said, and my intent to hurt was when I pulled that trigger. So. And, and what happened that got you to, into segregation for such a long time? I cut the warden across the face and the neck in uh, 19, December 26, 1996. That's so what I did that. That won't, that won't too good. That was a moment of passion. <laughs> That's something I've been regretting for the last 17 years almost. In 1986, when I did my crimes, I had papers saying if I do 10 years, then I can apply for parole. And then in 1995, they come up with this new law that says I don't get no parole. And it changed my whole life, my whole outlook on life. That made me snap. They took my parole in 95 and I stabbed the warden in 96. They sent me up here and I've been in segregation since. Come in the prison system, you know, fighting, slinging ink, hustling, doing whatever. So I'm in population, and my cellmate tells me, look, man, you got a guy going around telling his dudes that he's going to rape me. He said, he's going to knock you out. He's going to rape you. I said, OK, if I had a knife, I'd slit that boy's throat. He said, I'll make you one. We used to have uh, cassette tapes back then, you know, the plastic case around it. Took it, broke the stuff off. Took a lighter, melted it, folded it in half. Did that with another one. Melted it together. We put three brand new razors in it and melted it in there. Next morning, we walk out and he's crossed the yard. I walk up behind a dude, take my left hand, I wrap it and I palm his face. Put my right knee in his lower back and I stretch him back. I slit his throat from ear to ear. His friend said, oh my God, no. He dove like Superman and rolled up, jumped up, and ran across the yard. So when dude turned around, because it didn't really cut him deep, because cutting throats ain't easy, because you got all the ligaments and tendons in there. It's, it's a lot tougher than people think it is. 
you know, but he bleeding like a stuck pig. So when he turns around, I just start catching him, beat the living hell out of him. They come run up on me, you know, before they can tackle me and whatnot. I just step up, step back, because I didn't put the work in. You know, they put the handcuffs on me, they take me, and they bring me up here. Those rows are still not even. Make them even. We have six offenders on mental health precautions. Their SMI sheet should be on their door listing specifically what the uh, management instructions are for mental health. We now have the Glock 40 calibers uh, in position. So make sure you have your weapons card. Um, I think that's all I've got. Everything else should uh, be normal. Have a safe and peaceful day, and thank y'all. Tell me how Goodman's acting this morning. He come out of restraints last night about 12.30 and uh, waiting to get his property back to be reviewed. He's already got it. He's already got his property back. Um, he's still a little agitated. What you got running today? Things running smooth. Um, officers doing well. We are on lock. Anything about when we would have Zoom wreck? Not as of now. Okay. Well, once somebody starts in corrections, they quickly learn that they do make a difference. You know, it's law enforcement. Um, every day we're protecting the public. We save lives. And uh, you know that that's fulfilling to you. You know you get to go home and lay your head down at night and think about what you've done today and realize that you did make a difference and that you can make a difference. In this area, you'll see a lot of uh, coal mines. Uh, for years, that was the uh, career that everybody was drawn to because it was readily available. Sawmills, not a lot of high-end jobs in this area. Then uh, when Red Onion Prison opened, you know, there was a lot of job opportunities. And at that time, there was a, a lot of coal mines that were shutting down. People were being laid off. So a lot of the people that initially started at these places were people that were coming from the coal mines. My father is still working in the coal mines. This is his 40th year working in mines. You know, I was I was raised in a mining family, and that's really in this area. That's the the biggest and really about the only industry that working that red onion. It's tough. But to me, it's a good job compared to the coal mine. The unit managers make rounds daily to see the status of every offender in the building. You've got to know the offenders in your housing units. What's up with your situation? Yeah, right. Over here at the door, right here, you. When was your charge? Charge was in January. Over okay. Here for a 212 charge. That don't even qualify. For what is a 212 charge? A threatening bodily harm charge. A threatening bodily Who did you threaten? I ain't threatening nobody. The officer said he overheard me talking to somebody. They won't give me my property back. They won't give me nothing back. You know, at each door, each fender has a different problem. And, you know, they all want the answer yes. Before 10 o'clock in the morning, right? But yes is not the answer that they'll always get. No, 
probably did not. And I believe that we have a number of offenders that segregation is what the is what they want, is where, is where they want to live. They're afraid, for reasons they may be afraid living in, to live in general population. And then you've got some in here that just refuse to participate. What's going on? I'm just trying to get back home to Texas, man. How was what you did last week going to get you back home to Texas? If an offender acts out or misbehaves, there's consequences to that. If an inmate continues to act up or become disruptive, then that's when we take disciplinary action. What did you do last week? Did you flood or break the sprinkler head? Why, why did you break the sprinkler head? You feel better now? But you're feeling a little bit better now than you was last week? No, I haven't heard from my family like over a year. That's the last time I got any milk. Feeling better today, Lonnie? I got mental illness on some severe, mentally ill, psychotic, and erotic, and uh, being denied on sufficient. You're psychotic care. and erotic, is that what you said? Yeah, psychotic and erotic. That's a person that uh, <laughs> sent them out of touch with reality, don't know what's uh, chivalry, what's real, and what's uh, spurious and fake, and some of the torture techniques, like strapping prison to the bed with that useless uh, chest strap, starving. Well, I tell you what, Lonnie. We gonna go on about our business? All right, and look, also, he got me in prison with no evidence, they had no eyewitness, and um, the state found him guilty, and they had a lot of people with a crime like that. <laughs> that red onion, an offender would start out at level zero. That would be, you get your wreck in the showers, uh, and your food, and, and all the basic requirements of life, you get the very minimum. If you behave, have your cells in compliance, you're cooperative with the staff, you will go to level one. And at that point, you may pick up an electronic item. You may pick up a few more dollars of commissary. Uh, if the offender continues to cooperate, he can go to level two, you know, where he will pick up more privileges. They may have some more commissary. Of course, they get their TV. I love the TV because I feel like that's the only contact with life that I have, you know what I mean, as far as with the outside world, you know? I did 13 months straight without a television, and um, I cherish it. I cherish my TV now. I seen this show the other day on Discovery Channel. This dude was building tree houses. He was building tree houses up in trees, but they was like little mini mansions, little tree houses. He had spaceships and all kinds of shit. I'm like, wow. I wish I'd have went to an art school, for real, man. When I get up in the morning, I catch the shows on TV, watch the local news, watch uh, Married with Children, all that old stuff early in the morning. But sometimes I watch a movie and see something in the movie, brings back memories that remind me that I'm missing out on things that I used to do. I get upset about it. I cut the TV off or switch the channels or whatever. You know that show Bear Grylls? Uh, I mean, he does basically what I call uh, survival camping. You know, he'll go out there with just, you know, a knife and the clothes on his back and pretty much nothing else, and he just lives off the land. I love that stuff. I, I grew up doing it. I lived in the woods. When I come home from school, I wasn't watching TV. I was out in the woods. You know, I would climb in trees and throwing myself down mountains and, you know, jumping off of cliffs and rock climbing. I love that stuff. I miss it. And, you know, they got frosted glass on the window so we can't see how. Can't see trees or anything. Ninety percent of the offenders in Virginia return to the public, return to your communities. Previously, offenders that have been in segregation for quite a few years would go straight to the probation office. We would take the restraints off of him, and then he would be sent back to society. And we'd expect him to adjust to being in the public. 
And now our goal is to take the restraints off here, to take the risk inside the facility so the risk is not taken in the public. To get out of segregation, they must participate in our step-down program. We're start going over some things to use to help us deal with our anger. The question I'm gonna ask is, how you learned to express anger all your life? So how did you learn to express anger? This is gonna be in module three, handout three. Do you think we learned how to express anger? Do you think that's something learned? I mean, I learned more or less from the from, from my environment, the people I'm around, I grew up in a, in a rough neighborhood. You had to fight around. As you grew up, you learned to find ways to get what you wanted from people. Sometimes this involved violence, intimidation, or physical and emotional abuse. Many men in prison are there as a result of the lessons they have learned when growing up. We're trying to prepare them to be successful in a population setting. Offenders that have graduated through the program will go from a segregation environment into a population environment. anger management. You need the challenge series. This is it. No, that's the anger management. Hey, if you got a psycho program, that means that somebody is a psychiatrist. Okay. So why I'm not released up here for 10 years? You've got one more program to complete. How I got the program? I'm right here. Yeah, you gotta, once you complete the challenge program, then after you complete it, you'll go to d -Bill. I've been here seven years. I'm in segregation because they gave me nine charges to keep me back here. They refused to, to allow me to progress in the step Kelly. It's been seven years since I've had a fight with anybody. Seven years. I think I'm doing pretty damn good. I'll get up with you on that. We'll talk about it. Right. I understand that in any type of environment, whether it's in the free world or in prison, you have to have rules and regulations. We all understand that. You have to have rules. Otherwise, it'd be chaotic in here. It would be crazy. But when you actually have a valid problem if you have a valid issue it's not heard and it's like you have no voice and being a person and having no voice it hurts at times you know These offenders are um, extremely dangerous offenders. They are very violent and have been very violent. 
So when it comes down to those guys, there is a lot of risk involved with them. But through the program, these offenders have jobs rolling what we call plastic wire. Dude, the gravy was just nothing but water, dude. That's all it was, man. I like this. I like the map. See where the water. I don't touch the map. Is that you know the movie uh, Need for Speed? Yeah. Is that Jesse from Breaking Bad? Yeah. That's what I thought yeah. he was, man. Yeah, I, I recognized him. Yeah. Like, what's that one with Lucy Liu? Man? Oh, that's elementary. But they got this new show coming on ABC, I believe, Endgame or something, dude. It looked really cool. Mind games. Mind games. That's it. Yeah. It looked kind of cool. Christian Slater in it. Oh, never mind. That, that'll be canceled before the end of the season. Out here working, we can talk to each other about things on the TV and stuff like that. That's good. But we're still wearing shackles. We're still putting handcuffs. We still got guards with vests escorting you around. You know, I want to get out of say. There's got to be a way out. Close 14! And the monotony on the same thing over and over and over and over and over again it messes with your mind. Like when I first come to segregation, I didn't really have no problems. I was just angry. But after I stayed in seg so long, being isolated, it turned me worse. I had to go to the psychiatrist, get medication. Like when, whenever I don't take my medication, I cut on myself, I cut all over myself. You know, that's what segregation did to me. Look, I got two life sentences without the possibility of parole. So I'm in prison for the rest of my life. But I want to go home. I want to go home. That's all I want. I want to go home. You know, you ask a lot of these dudes, man, if they can go home, what do they want? Oh, they want cars, they want houses, they want all these girls and Kim Kardashian and, man, screw all that. I just want a good job. I'd love to have a wife, a couple of kids, and a dog. That's all I want out of life. That's all I ever want. I screwed up. I ain't blaming my parents or whatever. I did what I did. I accept responsibility for it. And if I got to spend the rest of my life in prison, then I'm going to suck it up and deal with it. That's the only thing I can do. Either that or kill myself, and I'm too much of a coward to kill myself. If I feel myself depressed, I shake it off and I start working out. And I'll work out for at least, uh, at least four hours. And I try to do that to where I'm so exhausted that I don't start dwelling on despair. You have to internalize it and then after internalizing so much, you know, the mind's funny. feel like you're relevant to somebody, you know? And if you don't feel like you're relevant to nobody in that cell, then it'll make you want to just lose your damn mind, you know, just go crazy.
I remember when I started, I didn't feel like I knew what I was doing or anything. I was uh, 20 years old, and I was just walking around doing a check and looking into a cell, and we had a guy. He was in cell 10 um, who had uh, bitten a hole in his arm. And he was, I remember stopping and looking at it and being like, you know, I was in shock, you know? I didn't really, I didn't know what I got myself into, to be honest with you. And my first reaction, I turned like, I turned sheet white. I was, I was freaked out. And uh, he just kind of looked at me, you know, and he said, shh. And blood was going everywhere. Medical had to come over there. It's a pretty crazy first incident, but it kind of broke me in. Mr. Marsh, you have any lunch today? Did lunch come? Did you accept lunch? Like to talk to me, Mr. Marsh? Yeah, as you know, as I mentioned to you yesterday, we're getting ready to send you over to Marion. How do you feel about going to Marion? Can't say. All right, we're gonna send you off and then we'll look for you to come back all healthy again. Okay? Okay. <laughs> there have been studies that have shown that segregation uh, can have harmful effects on a person's mental health. But I haven't really um, probably been in the system long enough to see that or to track it, if you will. It's just that uh, occasionally we do see that a, uh, an offender who has a history of no mental health services does all of a sudden start becoming symptomatic. And we have no other way to explain that except for the fact that they have been housed in this environment for such a long period of time. What's going on? Why are you back here? I busted my head open. How'd that happen? I was taking a shower and, and I passed out. How old are you now? 71. 71. How long have you been locked up? 54 years. Can you uh, tell us why you're back here? Some severe. It's say severe suicidal thoughts. Severe suicidal thoughts. Yeah. And we put you back here on precautions to kind of keep an eye on you, prevent you from harming yourself. Yeah. Yeah. When you're back in the building, uh, what are your concerns about being housed? Where I'm housed is segregation. It's just like I'm forgotten about. Yeah. I think we need, you know, more hands-on, you know, treatment. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, give me things to do, you know, other than being in the cell 23 hours. Yeah. I hear you. It's a challenge for us here. It's, it's a no challenge, challenge for us. My, my opinion is just they just don't care. Yeah, we don't care. Well, I can understand why you might have that impression. Hey, for real, doctor, I need your support. I need your support. I don't want to... Don't throw me back into where I left.
You know, I ain't had a visit in over five years. My family's in Richmond, and it's like 500 miles round trip to drive, and we only get one hour of visit, and you can't touch each other. My family used to come up here once a year, but now, you know, my mom's 73 years old. The rest of the family's dying on me. I call my brother once a month, and I call my mom once a month. That's the only contact I got. Being in the cell and not really being able to uh, socialize and mingle, it's like in a world of your own, and you just like, the longer you stay in there, you just like shut down. But you could talk to guys on event and stuff like that. But that's if you get a person that, you know, is uh, you know, sociable like yourself. So, you know, I'm on a bad event over here now. The vents suck air in and out of the cells. So you can like get up on the vent and you can scream and holler at the different inmates in the different cells that's connected to your cell. <laughs> you can make a chessboard out of a little like piece of paper, make little pieces and play chess on the vent. It's something just to do, just to pass time, you know? Just um, but yeah, get on there and play chess like you Bobby Fisher's um. You know, it's the way we communicate kind of privately without other people hearing us. This pod only has two people on the vent, just you and one other person. But in other pods, you know, you have four people on the vent. Being able to open up and talk, it, it really helps me to uh, think clearly instead of thinking in a negative way or a way that I shouldn't think. Me and Hanson were on the vent together now, so we know a lot about each other. And he knows me like he can tell in my voice when something's wrong. Like, he might call me and I'll get up and be like, hey. He'd be like, are you all right today? You know, he'll, he'll hear my voice if I don't want to talk. It's like, because he knows me that much. But, you know, and he'll know if I'm in a good mood because my tone of voice. So it's our telephone system. We, we kind of fill each other out. Even though you can talk to other dudes on event, eventually you get some smart ass punk. It's just a matter of time before he starts running his mouth. It's just a matter of time before he starts calling you a snitch and a faggot and all these other things, you know, cussing you out. They'll get to banging on the wall while you're trying to sleep. And you want to get to them because they won't let up. And they'll bang you seven, eight months at a time. And you got the lights on all day long. There's no switches on the lights. And you're just stuck in that cell. And it drives you crazy. If you just sit and just listen to all the different cells, you will hear a thousand arguments all day, every day, just about nothing. It's the anger and the frustration everybody feels inside themselves. You have this, you have this, 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 this rage that just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. And little things would just make you go crazy. For instance, mail is like the highlight of the day. You know, when you see that officer go past your door, and if you ain't got no mail coming through that door, you know, that, that, can, that can really be a damper in your day. It's like if you didn't have a piece of bread on your tray. You're supposed to get two pieces of bread on your tray. If I was missing a piece of bread on my tray, I would explode. They didn't run mail yesterday. They didn't run mail because of whatever reason they didn't run mail for. 
walk around the cell for hours. You can just walk in circles and circles and circles and circles and circles for hours and just, just think. You can't move. You can't move, you can't just walk around in circles. I don't expect the administration to understand what we go through behind them doors. There is no rules for the administration. They have no rules. They make up their own rules. They didn't come tell me why they didn't run the mail. They just told me that they didn't run the mail. If I didn't have a salt on my tray, give me my salt. I want my salt now. You know what I mean? Like it, it just, but it, but what it, it was that, it's like two totally different realities. So when Monday comes around, I'm looking for this mail and I don't get it. But don't nobody tell me nothing. Don't no CEO say nothing to me. Don't nobody come around and say, hey, they're not passing the mail out because of whatever. And if we don't get what we deserve or what we're supposed to have, and even with, even if we speak up and we snap out and go crazy because we're not getting what we're supposed to have in their guidelines, and then we're deemed as being disruptive to the security. And it's just all these different things that they stack on you. We have rules stacked six feet above our head. They don't follow the rules that they have in place, but they want us to follow every single rule by the T. Walking in circles and just laying down all day. And it makes you just want to just rebel and just be like, I don't care about none of the rules now. I don't care because even the rules that I follow, where's my other piece of bread? You know what I'm saying? Fuck them, <laughs> for real. Oh man, and like fuck them, you know, because in that cell, you just got so much anger. How we end up fighting? You know, like you gotta come in this cell and you gotta you gotta beat me up. You gotta beat me up. You gotta come here. I wanna fight you now. I just got so much pain built up inside of me. I wanna just feel it. You know what I'm saying? Give it to me. Like, don't play with me, just give it to me all the way. In that cell, don't nothing matter. I used to act out. I used to throw feces on the guards, feces on the inmates, get the uh, extraction team, the officers to come in my cell and fight them and get gassed up and get beat up and strapped down in five point restraints and all that. I've seen a lot of people get hurt really bad over the years during cell entries. Uh, busted knees, ankles, elbows, arms, um, you know, inmates. Um, actually getting their hands on an officer, it's very dangerous. I remember one time I got together, you know, a few guys, and we ended up covering our windows and just having a battle with the administration. And so they ended up coming in my cell, and we started just having to just a full-fledged physical combat. I used to love it. I mean, I really did. I used to love it. Why? Getting fired up. Um, you have to get in a certain state of mind before you go into a cell and fight another human being. It's combat. It's combat. Uh, it's kind of like the same feeling you get when you score a touchdown uh, or hit a home run. Uh, you got to get pumped up. When it comes down to using force to enforce rules, regulations, uh, whatever it may be, we will we will do what we have to do. When you're dealing with higher level offenders, their history, a lot of times it's extreme violence. So we have to treat them as such. Bottom line, my job is to protect the public safety and protect those staff that are here, protect the offenders. That encompasses a big picture. So we have to consider the big picture. What is best? What is safe? What is safe for all?
I'm 35 now. And basically from the time I was 11 years old, I've been incarcerated. I've only spent maybe a year and a half on the street. When I was uh, 10 years old, my dad left my mom. So me and my brother, we went back and forth between uh, my dad and my mom, and neither one of them wanted us. So they put us up, you know, in the foster system. So there was like a 17-year-old foster kid there, and he started bullying my brother. So I grabbed a pool cue and just started wailing on him with it and beat him down. And, you know, so I got kicked out of there, and I went to a group home. It's the bottom of your feet. So one day, this place had uh, banana splits. I'd never had none. Even to this day, I've never had one. I always wanted one. You know, that was like the quintessential thing as a child is a banana split. And uh, the dude there wouldn't give it to me. But I got mad. I'm going to kill myself if you don't. Oh, I don't think you will. You ain't got it in you. So I grabbed a fork and I shoved it through my wrist. I was about maybe 11 at the time. It took me to the hospital. You know, got kicked out, went to another foster home. Started getting in trouble. I stole a car, got busted, and uh, I go to juvie. You go to juvenile prison in Virginia, you fight every day. You know, and I did several years there. And that doesn't mean I've won every fight. I've got my ass whooped more times than I've won. But they don't call it gladiator school for nothing. So I make my way out, and I was living with my grandma at the time, and I tried to join the Army. But uh, they told me that I had to be six months off parole and probation before I could join. Got a job working electricity in Charlottesville. Uh, that was fun, because I've always been good with my hands. And uh, my grandma needed a stove. Hers was falling apart. So for Christmas, you know, I go and I get it, uh, you know, put a little down payment on it. But I get fired. And now I can't make the payments. There's no way in hell I'm gonna let them come repossess my grandma's stove. I'm like, man, you know what? Screw it. I can't get a job. I know what I'm good at. I break into the house, steal a couple guns. I steal a brand new 97 uh, Subaru Legacy Station Wagon. And I steal a bunch of other stuff. I got a gun. Got bullets for the gun. I'm headed up Interstate 29, 120 miles per hour in a station wagon. I mean, I'm getting it. You know, I'm like 19 years old. And the car's almost out of gas. I pull into the store, I fill up. I don't got no money on me. So I walk in, I grab a Coke. I walk up to the store owner. I just put a gun in his face and give me your money. So he pulls the money out of his wallet and he gives it to me. Open the cash register, give me the money. He opens it, said, man, take the money out and give it to me. He said, no. I said, man, if you don't, I'm going to kill you. He looked me square in the eyes and he said, young man, I don't think you will. I shot him in the chest. He fell behind the counter. I reached over, shot him twice in the back. I walked down the counter, walked back up, and I stood over top of him and I shot him six more times in the back of the head. Um, took the money and I left.
What you gonna do when somebody attacks you? I mean, you'll do what you gotta do. It's not gonna matter what program you put in front of somebody. So when I found out they was bringing me back, I was pissed. I was mad. Knowing that I was coming back to long-term segregation, I had to start getting my mind right. Because once you come over here, you don't know how long it's gonna be before they let you go and send you back out into the prison world, back in the population. I know I tried to escape, and that's why I'm here. I have no one to blame but myself. But at the same time, I'm not a violent inmate. And I have 18 years of demonstrating that. So you put me back in general population, I, I will not mess up. It was, it was a slip, uh, a lot of stuff going on in my head at the time. Um, I regret it every day. I regret it every day. Uh, so You're just, right. Uh, We'll never be forgot. You can't erase the past. Right. But this is not the end. It's still a work in progress. How long and where it's going to lead to, I can't answer that now. But it is a work in progress. Right. Okay, Mr. Freeman. Uh, I've always told that, and then it's, it's still never, I guess you know, uh, Progressing, I guess. You've had that opportunity in general population. You've proven at the time that you couldn't capitalize on that opportunity. You slipped, you made a mistake. From this point, you're working to regain that opportunity you lost due to your actions. Uh, me personally, I, I would love to progress off of right on you. You know, not just, you know, but. that door closes and you're in that confined spot. I couldn't imagine, for real. I, it would be awful being in here anyway. Yeah. That isolation wouldn't be something I don't think I could deal with easily either. Um, I think not being able to roam around would really, really take a toll on me. Yeah. I don't think I've actually thought about it as far as how I would act if I was behind the door. I killed a man. Should I have lost my life for the act I did? I took that man's life. I took him away from his wife, from his children, from his grandchildren. I took him away from his business. Who knows what happened to his family after he lost his store and lost his job? There's so many consequences that could have came from my actions. I took that man's life. 
Am I being punished enough? In my opinion, no, not even close. But seven, eight years of segregation isn't working because all it does is make you angry. It makes you more frustrated. All it's doing is turning us into caged animals. I call it reality TV. You know, I make my own reality television entertainment. And I got the hound dog. I like the hound dog. Hound dog, hot on that gal tail. Hot on that tail. You know, that's good entertainment too, you know, keep myself entertained. Try to, then, you know, like I said, I be having suicidal thoughts and so I try to keep myself in good mood most of the time, right? You know, when you look in the cell, you can't see out the window. I don't know, man. I mean, that's an old torture technique caused uh, deterioration of the brain. You know, the brain needs a uh, sensory, like any organ needs exercise sensory deprivation. That's what it's called. So that's why I'm kicking on the door. Every day is exactly the same, exactly the same. Every single day is exactly the same. In that cell by yourself, it's like you're not in prison and it's like you're somewhere else. You're just away from life. You're just away from life, period. I don't know if hope is what's keeping me going. I just think it's uh, my inner strength. I guess my, I, I, it's either I'm gonna find the strength or I'm gonna kill myself. You know, it's either one or two. So I haven't killed myself yet. So, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm just trying to make it. And I'm just. The handcuffs and shackles. Been wearing them for 17 and a half years. That's a long time. I've done more time in segregation than some guys got for murder. I ain't killed nobody. I've been doing what they told me to do. I've been acting right. I ain't been getting in no trouble. And as long as I do that, I don't see no reason why they can't let me out of segregation. Because I'm gonna die in prison, but what I did doesn't merit no death sentence. The judge didn't give me a death sentence. Why even give me a death sentence? Keeping me in segregation for the rest of my life is a death sentence. That's the way I look at it. Life ain't worth it without hope. What's the point of having a life if you just exist in it? Boy, 
I'm tired. I'm frustrated and I'm a little bit weak. Borderline depression, so to speak. You know, I think every human deals with it, regardless of where you're at. And how do you deal with it? Fantasizing, you know, just about going to different places. You know, I, I create entire landscapes in my mind. You know, uh, I have that ability to where I can close my eyes. And I can actually paint it. I can actually see it. I can actually walk through it. Sort of like a 3D model on a computer. Um, I pretty much do it every day. I'll cross my hands behind my back and I'll just close my eyes. You know, I just will it to exist and then I'm able to step into it. Sometimes it's childhood places that I've been. You know, like the woods when I was growing up. When it got too bad at home, I would just take off into the woods. In the woods, I was comfortable, I was safe. I didn't have to worry about getting the hell beat out of me. When you're walking through the forest, you know, climbing up the mountains, you know, and you feel the sponginess of the pine needles underneath your feet, you know, the branches, you know, brushing up against your clothes, the fresh air, you hear the squirrels chittering at you because you're invading their territory, the birds swooping around your head, you know peace, you know contentment. You know that this right here is what God created this world to be. He didn't create it for violence. He didn't create it for strife. He didn't create it for murder, rape, robbery, you know, lies and deceit and trickery. He didn't create it for all that. When you're out there in the forest by yourself, you know, and you're 20, 30 miles away from the closest person as far as you know, you get a true glimpse of what Eden was. You know, you get a true glimpse of what life is supposed to be. You know, it's your own little personal utopia. You know, it's a perfect environment. You know, it's the one place where I was happy. Oh, <laughs> 